fiery furnace right there with you, the fourth man in your fire. Amen? If you are in a battle today, if you're going through something that you have never faced before, it's something that just seems so hard that you are never going to get through it, I want you to know God is with you. Invite him. Invite him into your situation and watch him turn it around. Amen? Sometimes we want to try and fix it ourselves. Don't try to fix it today. Give it over to the Lord and he'll work it out. Amen? Hallelujah. Because we're moving forward today. Amen? Yes. Amen, Sister LeVon? Amen. We are moving forward.
my hope, my dream. What it would be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to sing at all? I can only
said, Father, can only our everything, our Father, and we come before your presence giving thanks and giving you praise, no one like you. Receive our thanks, our appreciation, even at we come, O oh God, with a grateful heart to worship you and adore you. We think of your loving kindness, and with loving cords, O oh God, you have drawn us through Jesus. And we realize, O oh God, that salvation cost a price, even the price of the death of Jesus and his suffering and all that he went through. And we come, O oh God, even this morning before your presence, knowing that in a moment we will be taking part in communion. 
We stand, O God, recognizing all that Jesus did for us on Calvary's cross, that, Lord God, it is but your grace, it is but your goodness and mercy and love and the work of atonement on the cross by Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. And this morning, Lord, we ask your forgiveness and grace. Lord, in, in any way, shape, or form, by thoughts, word, or deeds, we have hurt you, offended you, or just about anyone else. We seek your forgiveness today. And Lord, as we go to the communion, we stand in the gap for those that need grace, that need your mercy, that need salvation and healing and deliverance. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, beginning here, O God, among the community of saints and across this city and the nation and the world, we pray, God, that reach out to people here and those that are watching, that even right now, that you would minister to them, Lord, even as they wait upon you and minister to you, that, Lord, miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus, and we pray, God, fill all in all, we pray, that is all possible with our Savior and our Lord. I pray for your precious ones, O oh God, that are here and those that are watching, that you meet every need according to your riches and glory. Lord God, even as people pray for salvation in their home and deliverance in their home, and O oh God, that needs would be met, O oh God, because you are gracious God, we pray this in Jesus. Now thanks be to God for all the riches and glory and for the benefits that we receive and we enjoy. And Father, we give you praise, we give you glory. Because we ask this in Jesus Christ, our Lord, God's people said, amen. God's people said, amen. amen and amen. The choir is coming to sing the first song. We're going to worship the Lord and then go into a moment in communion.
may these words become our prayer as well, that you are all we need. The book of Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us, for it became him for whom all are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. I'd be talking about David this morning, but I want to talk about a greater David. The Old Testament David did not save anyone from their sins, but the one that comes out of David saves us. And he's made us perfect through suffering because of his suffering. And I pray even as we go to the communion, let us recognize that he's done all that he could. Nothing is amiss. Every aspect of our salvation and with it everything else that pertains to salvation. And as we participate, well, not only are we reminded of a historical event that takes that took place 2,000 years ago, but that is right now effectual and all the way to the coming of Jesus. For as, an, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. So all the way back and all the way to his coming, we gather to celebrate this great event. And I'm praying even as we are mindful and conscious of all that has happened and that is happening today by the effectual working of the cross in our life and that continues on till we're called or till Jesus comes, may that complete work that Jesus did be complete in our life and be perfect in our life this morning. He went through that suffering. Open yourself to the great miracle, not only of salvation and deliverance, but every change because of the power of the cross, because Jesus died for you and me. This is the Lord's table. You could be part of a body of this church, but unless you know him as your personal savior and through him, know not simply God Almighty, but know the Almighty God as your father and have a relationship, I want you to know if you did, you know that you need to be part of this communion. Otherwise, seek the Lord. Ask that he may forgive your sins and that apply the blood of Jesus and to know him as your personal savior. I'm inviting everyone that knows the Lord, walking with him and those that need grace and forgiveness today, that we would ask his mercy and grace and participate in this most wonderful table remembering and recognizing Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his coming back again for you and for me. Let's celebrate. Just a word, just listen to me just for a moment. As soon as you receive what would be the bread, please don't open it because we want to basically reach out and uh, uh, bless one another and pass the cup, but if it's opened, it, should not, it will not be passed on. But wait till we pray and then ask you to open. Till then, just don't open it sealed. Keep it sealed the way it is. Thank you.
What can wash away my sin? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Are creatures of habit but I had mentioned not to break the seal if anybody broke the seal stay where you are but if you have not broken the seal just before Pastor Hans prays turn to the person behind you or in front of you and pass the cup as long as the seals are not broken if it's broken stay where you are don't worry about it but just say God bless you let's sing this song this is my commandment, that you love one another. This is my commandment, that you love Broken. one another, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another, that your joy has given his life, Father God. Even as we exchanged the cups this morning, oh Father, in a very small way, we thank you that he exchanged his life for ours. We bless your name, oh Father, for it is you who has chosen us, oh God. It is you who has done this for us in our lives, Father. And as we partake of this cup and of this bread this morning, oh God, we do so joyfully, oh Father, recognizing the wonderful act of salvation and proclaiming his soon return in Christ's name, we take this. Amen.
As we sing this song, let's just give glory to God. The ushers are coming your way. We can properly dispose of this cup. Plus, let's just sing the song together to worship the Lord. What a joy to be here and to worship and to praise the Lord and to remind ourselves of all that God has done for us and that which comes out of the cross, the benefits we enjoy, whether it be spiritual or solical or whether it be physical or whether it be in every aspect of the welfare of our life, giving glory to God and to say thank you, Father, for all your kindness and goodness, but most of all, the free gift of salvation, so rich, so full, and so free. Thanks be to Jesus. We're continuing on our study about the issue of the heart and the change of heart, and we paused last Sunday to talk about what is it about David as opposed to Saul that God could say a man after my own heart. There may be many reasons, and we'll explore all of that, but for this moment, just let's think about the goodness and the mercy of God. Yes, David's life in the past had, a, had checkered history. Yes, it was faulty, filled with frailty, and yet it is the mercy and the grace of God that reached out to David as he does even today to people. No matter where you are, no matter where you come from, God's grace is sufficient because of what happened at Calvary's cross. Amen. When we go into the passage in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, here is the prophet Samuel speaking to Saul. And he says, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord had sought a man after his own heart, and the Lord had commanded him to be a 
captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. I want you to understand, Saul was a man that was called. You can read about the marvelous way in which tribe after tribe, house after house, and finally it came to Saul's own household, and from that comes Saul that was called. He was not a fluke, he was not a chance, but Saul was called. He stood shoulder above everyone else, and the son of Kish, a Benjaminite, went hiding because he was so humble. And the hand of God was upon Saul, and he was anointed with the oil of anointing by none other than the prophet Samuel. And so you look at the beginning of this king, the first king of Israel, and they're going to marvel at not only his humility, but also the fact that he joined himself with the prophets and began to prophesy with the anointing of the Spirit of God. He did that which was right in the beginning. You're going to find he put out all of the witches and all of the things that were happening and all the tall uh, trees and the groves that were people were worshiping. He put that out. He began in such a marvelous way, but he did not end the same way. Somewhere along, his heart just became hardened. Somewhere along, he began to be callous to the things and to the commandments of God. Somewhere along, there was deep down in his own spirit a sense of pride, a sense of thinking that he was more bigger and better than anyone else, to the point that he began to compromise on the commandments of God. Twice you find the prophet Samuel telling him and warning him that where he's going is dangerous. And towards the end he said, your disobedience is like the rebellion. That's what it is. And so these warnings said unto him, and the end, this is what God spoke to Samuel that he's looking for a man whose heart would be like his own heart, someone that would desire him and, and feel and hear and touch the, the beating of God's heart. God is not a man. He doesn't have a heart, a head, a ear, or a nose, or a hands, and yet this is giving us a metaphor of the desire of God the heart of God, knowing the things of God, loving the things that God loves. And he's saying, I sought for a man. And that would be someone that would do what he has commanded. Now, hundreds of years later in the New Testament, Paul is standing before the Sanhedrins and Jewish uh, leaders, and he's giving them a comprehensive history, and now he talks about David. When you turn to Acts chapter 13 and verse 22, this is what Saul, now called Paul of the New Testament, he's saying, and when he had removed him, that is Saul, he had raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also, that is God giving a testimony, and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Take these two words, found a man after my own heart, and what is, it continues to say, which shall fulfill all my will. You know when you turn to the book of Matthew chapter 22 and verse 14 and, uh, so, sorry, Matthew chapter 20, verse 14, Matthew chapter 22 and verse uh, 16, you're going to find that God is saying, um, no, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16, Matthew chapter 22 and verse 14, he says, many are called, but few are chosen. Again, he repeats that in 22 and verse 14. Many are called, but few are chosen. What I tend to think about is, here was a man that was called, but alas, he was not chosen. Saul, the first king, had great promises, the hand of God upon him, but somewhere he just missed up and messed up the opportunity. No, he did not sin like David. 
but his heart became callous and bitter. I want you to understand the most dangerous thing sometimes is we can be so casual in things of God that even though we might tend to measure the sins of the flesh and the sins of the soul, it is the sins of the spirit that more damns us than anything else. A person can be caught in the fruits or in the sins of the flesh and come to a realization I have sinned when confronted like David was by Nathan. But who could ever confront a man when he has pride lurking within him? When he has unbelief lurking within him? Because it's known to no one else unless God sovereignly reveals it. But no man would say, I'm sorry. How many times have we heard the word, I am so sorry. I've sinned against God. It's the sin of pride. It's a sin of unbelief. Did you know that the sin of unbelief stopped the children of Israel from entering into the promised land? Now, not to say that I'm saying what they did in the wild orgies and the things that they did should not be condemned. But that being said, Moses dealt with them. He melted the calf, the golden calf, and had them eat it with their food. They were humbled. They were in tears. But when it came to the sin that hardened their heart, it was a sin of unbelief. They mocked God. They mocked the words of God. They mocked at Moses. And what was it? Their heart got hardened. You remember someone else? Pharaoh's heart was hardened. In spite of the times that, Mo that Moses went, and can you believe a man that was called into that holy, royal, uh, what would be kingship? A man that started humbly, a man that had a zeal for God, simply began to have a hard heart to the point he was compromising on what God told him. And God said finally to Samuel, quit praying for this man because I've had enough of it. I have searched and looked for a man after my own heart and one that will do my will. I want you to realize a very important thing you find when you turn to this passage in Acts chapter 13 and verse 22. I sought for a man and I found a man, the son of Jesse, after my own heart. Earlier in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, I will seek. But here he says, I sought and I found a man after my own heart which shall fulfill all my will. Now when you think about this, my friend, the most important thing that we need to understand is heart. It is the heart from which all issues come about. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Guard, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What are the important things of life? It stems from the heart. Jesus, there's not so much the outside, but the one thing that's inside that corrupts a person. It's not so much as what comes into a man that, of course, will be physical and other things, but what comes out of a man is more damning, which could damn our spiritual life and our very soul. So, guard your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it stems the issues of life. Things that pertain to life things to do with worry and fear in the solical area, in the emotional area, areas of our intellect and will, areas of our spiritual life, our love, our devotion, areas even of our progress in our physical and in aspect of anything that God has put us in the service 
of whatever he is putting us into, whether it be a home as a son, a father, a wife, or in the community, or in a position, it all stems from the heart. Sense of, I'm not going to believe. I'm going to worry. I don't think I can do it. I don't think God can help me. It comes, and these are issues that affect the total man. It stems from the heart. But many a times we are slow to recognize, and I do realize the importance of psycho psychologists and psychiatrists. I do understand the importance of uh, what would be physici physicians, and all of that are very important. But the area that affects us ultimately in the final analysis, much more than the physical, as important as, is, as it is, much more than what would be our emotions, as much as the important that is, but it is our spirit, and people don't pay much attention to that. For the heart is where the issues, just like a physical heart that is pumping, that is vital organ for our entire phys physical being, much more is our heart spiritual that affects our entire life, whether it be from spirit, soul, body, the total man. So when you think about Samuel, this is what God spoke to Samuel when he went out. To seek the man that God said, out of the sons of Jesse, there are seven plus one, eight in all. And so here is what, when the father chooses and calls out his children, and God is saying to Samuel in First Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, listen to what he says. The Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance. Obviously, the countenance of Saul was far better looking and more handsome. David was a ruddy boy. Nor in the height of his statues, Saul was high above, shoulder above most folks. No, not on the stature, because I have refused him. The Lord seeth not as a man seeth, Man looks at the outward, he judges by the outward, but God is saying, don't judge a book by the cover. It doesn't matter what class, it doesn't matter what culture, it doesn't matter what color, it doesn't matter what tongue or, color or language or nation. The most important thing is when we come to the Lord, our spirit is reignited, and even though there's the aspect of our logical thinking and rational and the way in which we form an assessment, the Bible simply says, know things from the heart, judge by the Spirit. And so he says, for a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord look it on the heart. So the heart is so important. The heart is the place where it matters, and when it concerns Saul, and where it concerned David, it was a heart issue an issue of the heart. So when it comes to Saul, his rejection was his own heart. It was a spiritual heart failure. Well, when it comes to David, he is a man with a checkered past, and you can talk about all about him and what happened, but he is a man whose heart got so, was a man after my own heart, that his sins were and transgressions were washed by the blood, that he was cleansed and justified just as if it never happened because of the grace of God. And when you think about this, a very important aspect is, God said, I sought for a man and I found in David a man whose heart palms after my own heart who can literally hear my heartbeat. That's the man, anoint him. So here is what, much as um, Samuel was praying, so praying so hard for Saul, God sent him to an errand and says, I want you to anoint this man. Now when you come to this passage, you realize a couple of things. Maybe you may be saying, there's so much things that I admire about David. And I have written something, what I personally felt was in order of importance, 1 all the way to 16. 
uh, the 16th one is the most important. It's the matter of the will. But begins with loving God and goes about thirsting after God. It goes about loving God's word. It moves on to what would be someone who's grateful in his heart and is a worshiper, is a prayer, praiser, and comes to a place where there's a faith in this young man to stand in order to protect his father's sheep, whether facing a lion or even a bear. Oh, when you look at the man, and number six talks about his humility, so much can be said about that. And number eight is so amazing about this man, is a man that waits. Number seven is a sense of reverence for God, a respect for God, and a respect for those in authority. We'll see that with regard to Saul. But he's also a man who is literally someone that is number nine, repentant, seeking after God. Someone that understands the purity and integrity of heart. That doesn't mean perfect sinless, sinlessness. Only Jesus has that. But in the midst of and in spite of all that happened, will go to God, seek forgiveness, and cover his heart under the blood and the mercy of God. When you think about that, number 11 talks about his service that he did in the time of his generation and fulfill God's will for his life. Understanding number 12, the faithfulness of God, and 13, the compassion of God, and 14, when you understand his heart for unity of not only his total body and soul and spirit, but the unity of, of the people of God coming together under one camp, under the one leadership of God. Understanding protocol and knowing what it means to his life in respect and in interpersonal relationship and those with him, those under him, and particularly those above him. And number 16, the will. A man after my own heart who will do my will. These are some astoundingly important principles that we must learn. So if there may be 200 things, but I've chosen 16, and I put in those references because I believe there's so much, the Bible says that these things are written and written about these men that we might emulate that we might put them as examples, that the man of God may be instructed and be strengthened and blessed. So the things that are important and the things that have blessed them and the things that were noble, that we should emulate and that we should be able to uh, let that come into our lives and pray, God, help me to be like the way this person was. And when the Bible shows what's and all and understands their failure, that is something, Lord, help me to avoid because greater men than me and than I and you have fallen. Keep me away from that mess as well because we're so prone to fall as well. So this is a powerful, tremendous life. Now, having said that, you might think, okay, these are the qualities, and this is the qualities that I just put down in your notes. 16 qualities is the reason why God chose David? The answer is no. Excuse me? No. You mean to say all of this is not the reason? It has nothing to do with the reason for God choosing David. In the same way, when God chose us while we were yet in our sins, there was nothing based on our character Everything was based on God's character. Nothing based on our standing, everything based on Christ standing before his Father. Nothing based on our integrity, but everything based on the integrity of God and his word. Nothing based on works, but everything based on grace and grace and grace alone. Now the 16 qualities is important because after we come to the Lord, these are the will of God in our life. So you look at this man, Saul. He was called 
but he couldn't be chosen. Because even though he was called, and what a wonderful way he was called, somehow he was not able to bring about the works of salvation or do the will of God. While David was not only called, but he did the will of God, he was chosen by God. And this is some important for us to realize, not because of what David did, but because of what God did. And the grace is always important. You know, if you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 1, while David was a young lad, he did nothing good, he did nothing bad. Based on an individual long before he did exploits or long before he sinned, the Bible simply says, the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him, and from reigning over Israel, I fill your horn with oil, and I will send you to Jesse, the son of uh, uh, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. So it is not like the elder boys, the seven of them that were older, and the men of exploits maybe. But when you come to verse 13, you come to this place in 1 Samuel chapter, not 16, uh, chapter 16 and verse 13, go down to verse 13, and you're going to find, and so he, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went up and went to Ramah. So here's a young lad, not for anything he did or not for anything he did not do, and the sin that he did was long afterwards, God chose him before that. In other words, that is a choice that only God and God alone makes. So when you look at this passage, if you turn with me to the words of Jesus, because the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament, in John chapter 15 and verse 16, Jesus is saying, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and whatso you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Not only the fact that you are called, but you are chosen. I've chosen and why ordained you that you should bring forth you do what I've called you to do, bear fruit. So in the New Testament estimate of things, Saul is a man that was called, but he was a carnal Christian, never maturing to be spiritual, never doing the will of God. When you look at what about David, he was a man who is not carnal, not a babe, but he's spiritual, he's mature. Even though chron chronologically he was young, but God chose him, and he began to do the will of God, and he began to do what would be bearing fruits. He was not perfect. But however, I want you to understand the big difference. What you find in this passage is grace is unmerited favor. We will never be able to basically describe or even elongate in what measure about grace. People have written a lot of books. And only until we go to heaven can we only understand, because while we are here, we don't know all of it, but in heaven we would have the full of richer wisdom, that we would understand a lot about grace. If someone gave you a ticket to go to the, the greatest palace, the most beautiful place, and paid you a vacation, and all vacation paid, sent you to first class, and sent you into the most magnificent place, and you enjoyed it and say, my God, I don't understand why he would do this for me. I didn't do any favor to him. I didn't do anything. But he sends me on this fun-filled, luxury-packed vacation, all paid for, and more than ever, he's given me pocket money and spending money, whatever I need. And you are grateful until, of course, after a month or so, he would say, okay, you go back to New York. So our dream has come to an end. But think about heaven. The beauty of heaven, the splendor of heaven, not for just a lifetime, but for eternity. And we look at the face of our Savior and say, my God, 
I just want to thank you for Jesus that saved me. I don't know what I did, but grace and grace and grace alone. It is nothing but grace and grace alone. And when God gives you something, it is grace and grace alone. Whether he gives you a gift, whether he gives you the miracle, uh, uh, the wonders of miracle in your life and things to do that you have the gift, or whether it be faith, or whether it be whatever, it is without a charge, God has gifted in you, like salvation. Now, I want you to understand that it's hard to realize that there is a principle called the, uh, the understanding of God that He's able to choose. We choose our president, we choose the senators, but when it comes to the things of God, God is the final chooser. He says, you have not chosen me, I've chosen you. Long before we even thought of choosing God, He chose us. We were running as fast, far away from God, but He ran after us through the mercies of Jesus, and reached to us and opened our eyes to be able to know the glory of uh, the cross and all that Jesus did on the cross for us. You know, it's something hard to understand, but it's certainly predestination. The New Testament talks about it. Now, based on what we can understand, it's not simply he said Pharaoh is going to be hard. No, he gave him opportunities after opportunity. But God, who's able to see the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end, he's able to know all things. We don't understand why and how he chooses, but there's a determination. You know, when you look at Esau, he was what would be, like Saul, the first of him. Saul was the first king, a double portion. Esau was the firstborn a double portion. But Esau despised his birthright. Jacob was the second born, although they were twins, uh, by a couple of minutes maybe. But Esau had the privilege of being the firstborn, and you've got to go to the Old Testament to understand the principle of the firstborn and the mention of the firstborn. And the blessings and the double blessings they receive. And yet this man rejected it. Jacob craved for, it, craved for it, even though the way he went about getting it, God would have given, he went about doing it in a way that is cheating and supplanting, and the con artist to do that. But in the end, when you look at the two, like Saul and David, you're looking at Esau and Jacob. Like Saul, you would say, Esau is more preferable because Jacob has a conniving heart, doesn't he? But not realizing that God is working in his heart. God knows deepest things. God knows his cry. He knows his sigh. He knows his feeling. He knows every heartbeat and the heartbreak he has. And God is not finished with Jacob. But Esau's is a hard heart. Now, you and I may not understand that. We look at the outward manifestation. Esau is uh, as a man's man, like, uh, like uh, Saul. He's no mama's boy. He's out hunting for venison. He's what would be a strong he-man. And yet his heart was callous and hard. When you go into the Bible and understand, let's take uh, Romans chapter 9 and verse 13. It looks a little harsh. But I want you to understand, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What is it? It is, of course, the principle of predestination, but also a principle of a heart issue. Out the outward, we may look at Jacob and say, that's the man God would hate. But God sees further than any man would. God sees a cold-blooded heart of Esau. Two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain did the best. He brought the fruits of the land. I mean, he did the best, the flowers and the fruits and all of that. But God sees the heart. A man who says, I don't care, I'll just give what it is. Whereas his brother Abel knew the will of God. Did not want to do what God didn't say, wanted to do what God wants to do. Both of them called, and yet one is a chosen one. So when you carry this passage, I want you to understand a little bit of what the New Testament says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. 
talking about us, the New Testament says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of the children by Jesus Christ to himself, according, listen to the word, to the good pleasure of his will. To the good pleasure of his will. The pleasure is all of God's. has nothing to do with us. It is God and he has a prerogative to do what he wants. No pot would say to the porter, excuse me, I think I'm better than that. Why do you take that one up into a noble place? Because he's the porter. He does what he pleases. And yet, think about this. He's not giving up. Take a look at Jeremiah chapter 18 and understand the man, the porter would not give up, does everything as long as as the pot is in the potter's hand, mellow, flexible, malleable, they're very important. But understand when the heart is hard. So let me say, what would it be when it comes about David? Simply this, when you turn to chapter 70 of Psalm, uh, uh, Psalm chapter 78 and verse 70, look what it says about David. Psalm chapter 70, I'm sorry, Psalm chapter 78 and verse 70, it tells about God took David out of the sheepfold, that is taking care of his father's sheep, and God took him out from there, and he chose David his servant. He chose him, not simply called. All of the sons of Jesse was called, but God called David. Samuel, this is the man I chose. This is the man I found. He chose David also, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. That is the choosing of God. A man whose heart is mellowed is chosen over a man that is hard-hearted. Not by the outward manifestation that we would look, but deep down into the very heart of God, heart of man. Therein is the issue. Therein lies the ups and downs and the rising and falling of people. Therein is the heart many a times revealed, if not God knows it. So I ask, how can that be possible? You know, there's a passage in the book of uh, Psalms, uh, Psalm chapter 5 and verse 12, here is what David says, For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, will thou compass him as with a shield. So even before I ask that you pray, Lord, give me the faith of David, give me the fruits like David, Give me to do your will like David, or give me a heart that would be praising like David, a worshiper. I'm going to ask you that you pray this prayer. Lord, bless the righteous with your favor. We are all righteous, made because of Jesus. But pray that God's favor, favor and grace is unmerited only those who have spiritual understanding will realize it's not really based on what I do, it's based on what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Here is Jacob, and I want you to understand, outwardly he's a supplanter, he's a cheat, he's a con artist, but if there's anything he wanted, the man wanted to covet the best, the spiritual, all of the blessings that God would have given the firstborn. It's amazing, God says in his commandment, you shall not covet. Basically says you shall not covet your neighbor's cattle or your neighbor's wife or husband. You shall not covet his goods. And yet in the New Testament, when it comes to the gifts, I would pray that you would covet the best. Excuse me? That is what you need to a spiritual man understands far greater than all that you would look at and think of it in the natural. The things of eternity are the greatest that we can covet after. Jacob was a coveter. 
In the natural he was, but there's a spiritual coveting for things of God. And at Jabok, that really was the breaking point of this man. After 20 years, he broke through. And at Jacob, a supplanter cheat becomes Israel, excuse me, a prince with God. God saw the breakings. God saw the moving. God saw the sobbing. God saw the heart's cry that nobody else could see. God saw it. And he drew him for 20 years like the hound of heaven ran after him until at Jabbok there was a wrestling match and Jacob said, let me, the angel said, let me go. He says, I won't let you go till you bless me. What is your name? Amen. And the moment he comes to that confrontation of the truth, I'm but Jacob, a supplanter. God says, that's not what you'll be. You'll be Israel, a prince with God. You know, the grace of God, it is so important, if only we could understand. Here is what David describes himself, and he's asking God, because he says in um, Psalm chapter 17 and verse 8, make me as the apple of your eye. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wing. Excuse me, this is a metaphor, Lord. What you please may you be, find me pleasing to you, apple of my eye. You know, a doting father will always love his son as the apple of his eyes. No matter how much mischief this boy gives this father, but that is the apple of his eye. That is grace, grace, grace. You think about the mercy and the grace and the fullness of God. If you turn to Psalm 106 and verse 4, here again, David is writing. And there in Psalm 106 and verse 4, he goes on to say about this unmerited grace. Lord, remember me with the favor thou bearest unto thy people. Oh, visit me with salvation. You got to do that, Lord. You visit me with salvation. If you want to find a king far superior than any other king, including David. If you search through the scriptures and look for someone that is more nobler, more better, did better things, yeah, you can find that in the Bible. A young man by the name of Josiah, he became a king at a young age, but he had the tutelage of a priest that graced him with a love for God and a love for the scriptures. You know, you got to read this passage in uh, Second Kings chapter 22, uh, 23, but let's read from verse 22. Second Kings chapter 23, verse 22, 23, 24, and 25. Surely it was not hold in such a passover from the days of the judges that judge Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. When he came to reign at a young age, he realized they weren't following the things of God. The temple was in disarray, disrepair. He said, this is what you need to do, repair. And then he said, by the way, where's the book of the law? They said, we don't know. The last thing we saw was our grandfather talking about it. Search it out. And the high priest and priest went in and looked into the temple. And sure enough, dusted somewhere lying was the, 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 the Torah, the, the scriptures. And they picked it up, and he said, search the scriptures. And suddenly he says, what about the Passover? We haven't kept since the book of Judges. He says, we got to do that. And it says, not in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor in the days of the kings of Judah, this young man institute a revival, a reformation in Israel, in the kingdom of Judah. When you read the next verse in verse 23, Listen to what it says, but in the 18th year of King Joseph, wherein the past was hold into the Lord in Jerusalem. What a change. It had never been like this. When you go to verse 24, listen to what it says. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirit and wizards and the images and the idols and the abomination that was spied in the land and that he, he and all this found in the, he found in the house of God in verse 25. Listen to what it says here in the next verse, in verse 25. Like unto him, there was no king before, and turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, according to all the laws of Moses, neither 
After him arose any one like him. Before him, there was David. After him, there were others, but no one like this man. And yet, you don't find him mentioned as much as David. On the contrary, just one time in the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, the lineage of Jesus. But I want you to understand, 14 chapters are allocated about Abraham. When you think about it, 10 chapters to Jacob, another 14 chapters to Joseph, and 66 chapters when talking about David. 800 plus scriptures or names, his name is mentioned in the Old Testament, an amazing 57 times or 54 times in the New Testament, something like 935 times his name is mentioned. What is it about David? What is that so much about David? He had a checkered history. He had that frailty in his life. And I want you to understand what was so different was God looked at the heart of a man. And long after the sin, and long after he died, God testifies and says, that's a man after my own heart. God looks at the heart. And when you look at David, that's not about David. These 66 chapters talk about the one that is to come, that will be the ultimate, that would be the son of David, who will build and who will sit on the throne of his father. Luke chapter 2, we're told about Gabriel coming to Mary, the angel, and said, this is what will happen. He will be called so and so. He'll be this, he'll be that, which is all fulfilled. And then goes on to say, but then he will come and he will sit on the throne of his father David. He is the ultimate. So if you were to look at a parallel, here is one with his mistake and yet a heart, speaking about the ultimate David that would come and sit upon the throne. The cry of every heart across the world is a theocracy under God. It has failed, whether it be under Christendom or Islam or Hinduism or communism. God has said, go ahead and try everything. Man has tried everything, from capitalism to communism to socialism to dictatorship to you name it, whatever you want. It has not brought peace. And one day, there would be the kingdom of Israel, not this kingdom, which is present, which is not a kingdom, it's a state, like any other state, it is ugly, and is full of mire with sin, like America and like any other nation. But that will change. And only because, not because of a prime minister or president sitting there, or years to come, there will be a king, and the kingdom will be revived, and he will sit on the throne of his father, David, and there will be ultimate peace. There would be equality and justice. It won't happen until then. Perfect love and harmony. So much so the lion will sit down with the lamb and the lion will not kill. That a child can put his hand in the hole of a, of a cobra and will not be bitten. There is what a perfect peace where everything was fallen apart, whether it be the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, mineral kingdom, no matter what kingdom under man, when man is brought restoration, the ultimate, there would be total, complete peace. For that seventh day, we are at the end of the sixth day or 6,000 years, but the close of that will be when Jesus comes back and he will set up the kingdom and he is in the line of David, the ultimate David, without sin and what is perfect. But that reason is an amazing. He shows grace. So when you check this out, I want you to understand if there's anything, what would you say of David? If, David, if, can you tell us something about yourself? Let me read what David would say in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 18. Then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me to? And this was yet a small thing in your sight, O Lord God, but thou hast spoken also of your servants out for a great while to come, and 
Is this the manner of man, O Lord God? Verse 20, And what can David say more than unto you? For thou, Lord God, knowest your servant. For thy word's sake, and according to your own heart, hast thou done all these things to make thy servants know. He's not the king, he's a servant. Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, neither is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation in the earth is like your people, even Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself, and to make himself a name, and to do for you a great things, and terrible for your land, before your people, which thou redeems, do from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. For thou hast confirmed thyself, thy people Israel, to be a people unto you forever. And thou, Lord, art become their God. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as what you have said. And let thy name be magnified forever saying, The Lord of hosts is the Lord God over Israel, and let the house of your servant be established before thee. For thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, has revealed to your servant, saying, I will build thee an house. Therefore has thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer. And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true, and thou promised thy goodness to your servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue to forever before you, for thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it, and with thy blessing let the house of your servant be blessed forever. This is the heart of a man. Even though he was the greatest king and the golden days of Israel, was none other than his time. Out of nothing, just taking care of his father's sheep, God raised him to be the greatest king. And now he comes not with a pompous heart or a hardened -like heart like Saul, but with a soft, pliable heart, softened heart. He says, Lord, who is your servant? Why have you blessed me? I can say this, David, one word, grace. Another word, grace. Amen. Another word, grace. And grace alone. Give the Lord a clap offering. So let me say this. When you look at these 16 things, this is what I want you to know. Now that you are called, why has God placed you here on earth? He could have saved me in the year that God saved me and taken me home the year that God saved me, though I could have gone to heaven without having any sin. But why did he put me on this earth? Why did he put you on this earth? The ups and downs and the struggles and the challenges and the failures and the rising, simply that we would do his will. We put us here because... This is not our home, but he's testing our hearts. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 3. To know what is in our heart, and he's putting us here. We're called, but to be chosen. I have found a man. He has a heart, and he's got a heart like mine. And then to do my will. Saul was called, but he couldn't be chosen. David was called, and his heart was always open in spite of his sin. He sinned royally, and he repented royally. He sinned passionately, he repented passionately. There's something I wanted to know, top on the list. I will speak about it next Sunday. Number one, he was saved, faith, 
But faith comes with work. And what was number one? You'll read that all through the psalm. His love for God. Lord, I love you. I love you with all my heart. I'm just paraphrasing. I woke up last night, Lord, and I looked up to him and I said, Lord, I just love you. For no other reason than I just love you. I'm madly in love with you. And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And David said, I will love the Lord with all my heart. Number two is after he was saved, he had fruits of salvation. He thirsted for the living God. Oh, as a deer panted after the river brooks, Lord. My soul panted for you. Yes, he sinned, but he got up. And he thirsted for God like no one's business. He just thirsted. Lord, I just want to say I'm thirsty for you, like in a dry and thirsty land. Have you been there natural? Then you've got to be there in the spiritual. I'm so famished, Lord, I need you. It could be at midnight, it could be daytime, but I just cannot get enough of you. Number three on the list is he was a man who loved the word. Thy word have I hid in my heart. I've learned my lesson that I would not sin against you. This Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. And what is so different about this than any other Psalm, this huge long Psalm, is all about, Lord, I love your word. It's your del- my delight day in and day out. I meditate upon it. I love you. After salvation, you've got to love the word. Number four, he would look out of the palace and say, God, I just want to praise you. I don't know how I could ever be grateful. I will worship you. No, no, out of my heart proceeds a new song unto you. Oh, just let me write it, Lord. Just let me write it. I pour my heart to you in good times, in bad times, and in between times. I just want to tell you, Lord, I praise you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. After salvation, you must praise the Lord. You're not saved because of praise, but you are saved to praise the Lord. Give the Lord a clap offering. (laughs) Number five, a man who was saved to have faith. James says, You have faith and you talk to me about your faith. Yes, you are called. But tell me, where are the works of your faith? Many are called, but few are chosen. And they are people. You say, Lord, I have faith. Yes, it's a gift. But God is saying, work that gift out. You know, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, now that not only in my presence, but also in my absence, work out your salvation. You have, I thought, you don't work your salvation. It's free, yes. But now that salvation there, work that out in your life every day. Because verse 13, it is God that wills. He's the one who gives it to you. You have faith, then work that faith out. Lord, I have faith, I have faith. Don't, what are you crying to me for? Get up and strengthen and enlarge in that you will have great faith. You are called and you have that nugget. You have that seed faith. Now you are chosen. Go ahead and move into faith. You are delivered, you are healed, but move in that healing, move in that deliverance, and say, Lord, I'm called, but I want to move in what you have given me. You have a gift that comes free. You didn't pay a price for it. Now move in the gift that God has given you. You don't need to go to heaven and say, yeah, this is the gift, and you never used it. You are not only called, but you are also chosen to do the will of God. Give the Lord a clap offering. I say this so important that number five is faith. Number six is humility. He constantly covered himself in prayer and the word of God. And Lord, don't let my heart be ardent. Lord, just let my heart be metal and and mellow before you. I don't want to have a hard heart. I know how difficult it is. I've gone through that, Lord. His heart was ever humble. And he was humble before God. He was humble before those that he worked and those that around him. He was a humble man. Number six, 
And number seven is a sense of an awe of, he never lost the awe for God. He never lost the awe and respect and reverence for God. Number eight, that he always reminded himself it was God's goodness, his mercy. That is amazing when you look at all these points. And I'm going to repeat this. Not for anything of this did God say, okay, I'm choosing you. But it came about God's call, and God has finally seen a man who's moving. So let's, amazing, it comes to the end, to do thy will. Number 10 and number 11 especially sought about service. Let me ask you to turn to Acts chapter 13 and verse 36. The closing days, and what would it be said about this man? In Acts chapter 13 and verse 36, David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, went to sleep, was laid unto the fathers, and saw corruption. The great son of David, the perfect picture that is to come, went without sin and saw no corruption, for on the third day he rose. He's the captain of our salvation. A picture of David to say he was the captain of Israel, but a greater captain is here. Even Jesus Christ comes out of the loin of David, who will be the ultimate and will set up the kingdom. And I'm going to ask you, are you part of the kingdom of Jesus, the ultimate David? Are you able to say, thank you, Lord, that I've, I've been called? But would you go on to say, and chosen to be like David, a man after God's own heart to do his will? Give the Lord a clap offering. Glory, hallelujah. 
God. Hallelujah. For those watching, I want to thank you for being with us today from across the world. But I say, give your heart to the Lord. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and give every praise to God. Give every gift to God, but your heart needs to come to the Lord. Surrender your heart to the Lord. Thank you for being with us. Until next time again, God bless you and God be with you. Amen. Just before, just before Pastor Hans comes to pray for the offering.